Hi, everyone. Welcome to this session. My name is Mandy McKay. I am the Sustainability Director uh, for Sierra Nevada Brewing Company. Sierra Nevada is an official partner of Sea Change. Um, and while our primary mission is to brew amazing beer and kombucha and other products, uh, we've been committed to sustainable operations for more than four decades, um, which makes us really proud to help pull together this event uh, and these opportunities for learning and conversation. So thanks for being here and welcome. Uh, in this session, we'll be talking about how conservation and technology join forces for success. Um, so we'll be thinking about the global call for land and water conservation, uh, the vital importance of preserving biodiversity, uh, and how technology intersects with all of that, helps bolster it, and actually drives its success. Um, so we'll start with an overview of why preserving land and water um, is critical to resiliency and sustainability. And then we'll look at how remote sensing and earth observation um, links those local efforts with that global challenge that we're all talking about. Um, so I know a lot about how to make a brewery more sustainable, but I certainly don't have the background uh, for the, that we need for this conversation. Um, so I have the pleasure of introducing both Joel Johnson and Andrew Zoli as our panelists for this conversation. So they will bring you that expertise and knowledge. I'm really looking forward to talking with you both. Real briefly, um, Joel Johnson, he's the Chief Marketing and Communications Officer for the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation. He leads the communications and engagement strategy for the foundation's ultimate goal of safeguarding biodiversity by conserving 50% of our land and seas, um, also known as the Half Earth Project, which I know we'll hear more about. Uh, and then Andrew Zoli, he's the Vice President of Global Impact Initiatives for Planet, uh, a satellite and technology company that's helped revolutionize um, the earth observation industry. Uh, he's focused on ensuring that the company's data, products, and services achieve their highest humanitarian, sustainable development, and scientific potential. So again, we've got a lot of expertise here. I'm really looking forward to talking to you both. Um, I think I'd like to kick it off with a level set and an overview of why we're talking about biodiversity, why we're talking about land and water conservation, why it's important, um, some of us may be familiar with, you know, the Convention on Biological Diversity or some of these calls to action that we've seen in the last year or so around 30 by 30, um, protecting land and water. Um, so I don't know if, Joel, I'll probably kick to you first, but Andrew, please jump in and we'll just kind of start there. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great place to start. Um, and thank you, Mandy, and thank you to everyone at Sea Change for, for having us. I'm looking forward to the conversation with you all and Andrew. Um, so let me just jump in by saying, uh, yeah, there's a lot of calls to action right now. And no matter what sector you're in, the private or public sector, uh, nonprofit or NGO or government, um, there is a big conversation going on about how we are going to address fundamentally these sort of two twin crises that are affecting the planet. One is biodiversity, and that's the extinction threat. Um, we're basically losing species across the globe at an unprecedented rate. And by 2050, scientists estimate we'll have about a million of the 10 million known species gone extinct, which is terrifying. Um, hopefully humanity is not in that mix. The other one is the obvious impacts of climate change. And this is a, a crazy summer coming out of the pandemic here in the United States. We're seeing um, an unprecedented um, uh, urgency around responding to, you know, forest fires, drought, heat waves, uh, flooding, a number of natural disasters exasperated by man-made impacts on our environment through climate change. Two big issues. And so everyone's sort of clamoring and saying, how are we going to address this? And this is this interesting moment where a lot of these sectors can come together, technology, and um, the, the entire uh, space around that, um, the corporate sector, the public and private sector, and then of course the scientific sector and the nonprofit sector. And uh, I just think there's, uh, this is the right time to be having a, this session because um, in truth, we've started to collaborate and we've been collaborating now for a couple of decades, kind of very quietly. And um, in the next, five to 10 years, you know, now in the next five to 10 years, we're going to see more calls to action for this kind of collaboration. We're going to see things like biodiversity loss mainstream and get more broadly known by the public um, as 
these other sectors start to talk about this issue. So um, in, a, in a sense, that's kind of where we are. And I think folks will be familiar now, especially if you're in California or other places, with the call for 30 by 30. So what is 30 by 30? Very quickly, it is a call to preserve 30% of the land and seas by 2030 in the next you know, roughly nine to 10 years. Mm -hmm. That is a framework target that has come out of the Convention on Biological Diversity and the United Nations. It's now a, um, uh, in the first draft of the new framework, uh, moving forward as a target. It's backed by the G7, over 80 different countries across the globe. Um, and uh, as that becomes a, a call to action, where does the Half Earth Project fit into it? Where does the Wilson Biodiversity Foundation fit into it? Well, we sort of see ourselves as the inspiration for that work, both scientifically through the work of our namesake founder, E.O. Wilson, but then also in a very practical way, the way we're doing our research today. And so ultimately that's what we wanna do through the foundation is help things like 30 by 30 be wildly successful so that we can address the biodiversity crisis. Awesome. Thanks, Joel. I, as you were talking, it reminded me, you mentioned, you know, people are becoming more aware and we will start to see, at least I hope, and I think all of us on the panel do that, you know, something, the conversation around biodiversity will be more mainstream. I've been in the sustainability field for 15 years and I was not fully aware that California, where I'm located and where our headquarters is, um, is a biodiversity hotspot mm. for the planet. It's like one of the top biodiversity um, spots. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't even fully aware of that. And so I think you're right. And I hope more people start engaging with it at that level and understanding why conserving land and water and therefore biodiversity is mm -hmm. means helping ourselves. It means all the systems that we rely on, ecosystem services and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, I'll, I'll just share that. I, I think hopefully more people are starting to talk about this, this interaction. Yeah. Mandy, you're totally right. You know, the thing that we have to remember about the twin crises that Joel mentioned is that they're connected. And, and really we have self you know, we, have a, we have a giant hairball of interconnected issues. Mm -hmm. When we create negative feedback loops for the climate, we dry out the landscape. And, and in California, we create, we, we artif when we artificially suppress the natural fire cycle, and we move more and more people into the landscape and we let climate change dry out the tinder, we create the opportunity for the extraordinary, you know, kind of Blade Runner summer that we had last year. And, and certainly looking like we're gonna have a, a really difficult all year round fire season in California, just as an example. The thing is when those fires go up, they're, they're starting to torch trees that we rely on for carbon sequestration. Mm -hmm. and habitat. So what happens is we, we amplify both of the problems with the kinds of calamities that are caused by one or the other. And so we, we're in this situation now where we're going to have to think about solutions to more than one problem at a time. We're going to have to think in systems terms, mm -hmm. and we're going to have to see all of those interconnections and, and try to map them out. And that's what the conservation science community is doing. That's what what policymakers are starting to, to, to figure out, I think at, at scale. I, I think it's a, a worthwhile kind of baselining thing for the people who are listening, just to remember that humanity has already terraformed 75% of the planet. We use a third of the land mass of the planet for agriculture. We've transformed the oceans and we face the million species potential for extinction that, that Joel mentioned. And that's all before another billion people show up in just the next 10 years. So we're living in this time of spikes when the human footprint is going nonlinear and all of the correlated variables are going nonlinear. So if we don't figure out how to bend the curve of the phrase we learned in, mm -hmm. you know, during the COVID pandemic on these other ones, the situation is going to continue to self-compound. So this is the moment when, when we really need these kinds of programs, the, the kind that Joel and his colleagues are, are um, advocating for so strongly. Go ahead, Joel. Yeah, and I think that, you know, um, just to build on, on that, you know, the conservation science community is now looking for solutions, right? So when you hear 30 by 30, you go, what is that? Or half earth, what is that? That's a, that's a solution. It's a, it's a hopeful, somewhat optimistic, 
solution. And it presents a target that the global community can get around, you know, and through the UN and other organizations. So what do those solutions look like? You know, ultimately, when we talk about the Half Earth Project and preserving half, people kind of step back and they're kind of shocked by that number. You know, it's, it's important to point out that, first of all, um, you know, it's not really half of the, of the world that, that really needs protecting. We're already protecting a large portion of the world, lots of seas, lots of land territories through reserves, through marine protected areas, through national parks, through land trusts, even in public gardens and, and public lands um, all across the world. What we're talking about is trying to find the next, say, 30% or so that will get us to that target. Of, of half. So two things, why do we need half? We need half because the science basically tells us that we need roughly half of the land mass of the planet to be preserved for the bulk of the biodiversity of, of the planet. Where can you find that biodiversity? The, the vast majority of the biodiversity is along the tropics and particularly it's on indigenous lands, people's lands, um, it's across the equator. Um, and then the majority of that land is currently stewarded by indigenous peoples and local communities. So what this also calls to us to do is to collaborate globally, culturally, across borders, geopolitical borders, to use the technology we have to drive change in those places to, 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 to hit those goals. And then that half doesn't become so terrifying anymore. It doesn't become so big. It actually gets small when you realize, oh, we're talking about helping places like uh, Guam or Paraguay or um, uh, uh, places like Kenya support and preserve more of the land that holds this biodiversity together. And then, you know, what's interesting is when we do that work, as Andrew said, it has lots of different impacts. You know, the way in which humanity has come to address and think about the natural world is to think about it as um, something that we can pull or extract resources from. That happens in two ways. One, in a, an extractive way where we take resources, but one, in a way that just actually maintains human, human you know, it, it maintains life on earth, it maintains our lives. So carbon sequestration is a big part of the ecosystem services of a healthy environment. But we're also talking about, you know, pollinators. You know, we're talking about the possibility to continue to eat, you know, our global food stocks rely on insects, billions and billions, trillions of insects um, and different species of insects as well, right? Um, we're also talking about not just, you know, food, but we're also talking about those keystone species that maintain habitats, right? So the big mammals and the whales and the, the lions and the wolves, those types of things maintain a healthy environment as well. So when you take a whole of ecosystem approach, it then makes it possible to basically identify and protect the sufficient amount of land, the right amount of land mm -hmm. and water in order to, to, to safeguard biodiversity. And that's where the technology comes in. So where we talk about the tools of remote sensing and spatial planning mm -hmm. um, and basically um, a high level of conservation science where we are able to essentially project and identify what particular lands, what particular areas in the seas require protection. That's basically what the science of the Half Earth Project is doing in partnership with um, global technology and mapping companies like Esri um, and their partners like Planet to uh, identify those locations and then bring that information and data to decision makers. You know, like I would love, you know, one way of thinking about this is I know that the beer at Sierra Nevada Brewing absolutely relies on, you know, bees and insects pollinating hops, right? You know, so in one way we're thinking about it as how does this impact me? Well, it's that technology we go to map, the, you know, the, the appropriate places where those hops are growing, the species on that land that makes it to that, you know, um, that, that hop that makes it to that bottle that then gets into the hand of the average person, right? We can take all of this and bring it back, you know, down to earth to, to who we are and what we want and, 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 and what we think is a good life. And that's one yeah. of the ways we can mainstream it. Well, and that's what I love about this conversation and thinking about biodiversity as a umbrella conversation 
back to Andrew, what both of you have said around systems thinking and this broad view, a landscape view. When you talk about biodiversity, you're talking about all the climate impacts, water, uh, ecosystems, um, watersheds, right? There's a, they're all interconnected. And so it's a way to talk about all of our big challenges and how they all interrelate. Um, so thanks for segueing to technology because a term I learned recently, which you two probably know very well, but is this idea of precision conservation. Mm -hmm. um, so Andrew, I'd love to hear how Planet um, thinks about this and how you know remote sensing and earth observation can truly drive these conservation efforts and support it. Sure. Well, let me let me start uh, a couple of steps back because most of the people who are watching this are not remote sensing technology experts. Um, you know, when uh, NASA or one of the international space agencies launches a, a satellite into orbit, <clears throat> they have to instrument the satellite with control mechanisms that are constantly observing the behavior of the satellite. Because if it starts to tumble, it needs to be corrected. And that means that you have to measure what the satellite is doing faster than it's doing it. You actually need to continuously observe what's going on so that you can course correct. If you only observed every 20 minutes, you'd lose every satellite you put up because the satellites would tumble out of orbit before you got another measurement of how they were doing. Well, we're all on a satellite right now. We're on a satellite that's orbiting the sun with, with billions and billions of astronauts on it. And I don't just mean the human beings, it's, it's billions and billions, it's you know, seven and a half, eight billion people uh, today. And it's the broader community of life, which are also all of our fellow astronauts on this, uh, on this uh, spaceship. And if we want to guide the behavior of the biosphere and of the giant interconnected web of life of which we are a part, we have to be continuously measuring it too. And so uh, Planet was founded as a good, and I, I'll talk about one or two examples of how this observational capacity drives, drives change. So historically, satellites are the size of school buses. They're, they're, they take hundreds of millions or billions of dollars to make. You probably might've seen one. They're, they're you know, huge and covered in orange foil. And a group of young NASA engineers uh, uh, about 15 years ago said, we wanna do something different. So they went down to Best Buy and they bought a stack of these things. And they took them back to the lab, took the guts out of the phone, built tiny little satellites you could hold in the palm of your hand and gave them to the astronauts who were headed to the International Space Station, asked them to throw them out the airlock when they got there to see how your phone would do in space. And it turns out your phone does great in space if it's shielded correctly, and it has a camera and a computer and a GPS, a radio, a lot of things the big instruments have in a tiny little package. Now, when you can make satellites really small, and that's exactly what it led to, satellites that were about the size of a loaf of bread, you can, instead of making one, you can make hundreds. And that's just what Planet has done. So if you can imagine, if you're watching this uh, at, your, at your computer on your phone, imagine you're the sun, here's the earth, and it's spinning around on a daily basis. This is hundreds of satellites that spin over the North Pole, down over the equator, down over the South Pole, and they spin like this. And as the earth turns sideways underneath them, they act as a line scanner for the planet. They basically image collectively every square meter of the earth. We, we image it roughly three meters per pixel. So you can imagine we're not reading people's newspapers. We're not spying on people, but it's enough to see uh, every tree crown from space. It's enough to see just about. Uh, it's enough to see all the agricultural fields. It's enough to see every refugee camp, every city, every road, every building, every day. Again, not at a level that violates your privacy, but because we're looking every day, we're able to see the kinds of changes that occur and most importantly, not just the changes that have occurred, but the signals of change that are about to occur. So you asked this great question, Mandy, about, uh, about precision conservation. That data has enormous utility in guiding more sustainable behaviors. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. If we can help farmers use, you know, if you're, if you're growing a corn crop in Iowa, you're basically an IT shop that happens to grow things. Farmers today are using all kinds of technologies to help them determine what to grow and when. 
And if we can use data to help the farmer use one barrel less of fertilizer, that's one less barrel of, of um, you know, hydrocarbon based uh, fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizer that we have to produce and transport that we put on the crops and then washes off the crops and into the Mississippi and comes down the Mississippi and creates a dead zone the size of New Jersey. So the more efficient we can be with those kinds of behaviors, the better. The second thing we know is that more ecologically efficient, I mean, second thing we know is that, um, is that monitoring improves conservation outcomes, particularly when you get the data and the tools into the hands of people who live in those places. The, Joel mentioned the incredible power of indigenous guardianship of the world's vital ecosystems. Indigenous people make up 5% of the world's population. They sit on a third of the world's land mass with 80% of the remaining biodiversity and 40% of remaining intact ecosystems. But their, their territories are under constant barrage from illegal mining and logging. Well, we can see all those behaviors from space. We can actually help indigenous peoples uh, with the right information at the right time and their representatives. And we have to do this together. It's not a one, it's not you know Silicon Valley landing a UFO and, and saying, here we have the solution. It's about building webs and networks of trust and cooperation. So if we can get the right information into people's hands, we know we can help improve that guardianship. Uh, the last thing where, where uh, this data and these tools are really valuable is in illuminating and making the invisible visible. We uh, undertook this really major project with a team of research scientists from Arizona State University and the University of Queensland in Australia funded by a team at an organization called Vulcan to build something called the Allen Coral Atlas, which is a comprehensive mapping and high resolution of all of the world's coral reefs with a system that continuously monitors them for change, for coral bleaching events and, and other forms of change. Those kinds of tools by just illuminating where the biodiversity is mm -hmm. has led to numerous new marine protected areas and new uh, 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 biodiversity hotspots that are protected and enshrined with the full force of law and, and government standing behind them and not the kind of traditional paper parks that we sometimes see, but really toothsome, wholesome mm -hmm. uh, conservation methods. So yeah. you can't fix what you can't see. No. We can make it visible. I think we can actually begin to fulfill the vision that uh, that Joel and 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 Ed and everybody at the, the foundation is advancing. It's so true. Your point about you, if you can't see something, I mean, this is this is the classic conversation around climate change, right? And I think for better or for worse, I think people are maybe really finally experiencing it because it has ramped up and it's become very personal and people literally are seeing and feeling it and experience it in the last several years, um, more so than before. But again, if you can't see something, you don't understand it, can't connect it to yourself, you can't connect it to your community, your region, your family, your company, whatever it is. Right. Um, and so that, that really is probably the biggest part about what Planet and other, you know, technology companies can do is bring it home and show you exactly what's happening and connect it to your local impacts. And I know with Half Earth, um, you know, we'll see some visuals of, of the Half Earth uh, maps, but that's exactly what we're trying to do, right, is right. Um, show people what biodiversity looks like um, mm -hmm. so that they can really wrap their head around it. That's exactly right. The, the Half Earth Project map is really um, the visualization of all the things that, that Andrew is talking about. It's making the invisible visible. What we focus on is showing the priority areas based on that science, based on the technology and based on the data that we derive from that technology of remote sensing to identify all the places where we could do more to save biodiversity by protecting those areas. And um, on the Half Earth Project map, you'll see a lot of our coastlines are ringed in yellow and those are high priority areas for protection because there's this, a lot of biodiversity along those coastlines and in places where you would naturally suspect it, key biodiversity areas, biodiversity hotspots. But what's really interesting about the Half Earth Project map and is that we also show based on uh, the, the research and the science, those places that are insufficiently protected, mm -hmm. right? Um, 
And we do that by making sure that all of the, by taking a global approach, that all of the life contributes to global biodiversity. So rather than just sort of saying, what can I do in Borneo? What can I do in the Bahamas? What can I do in French Guyana? It's really about saying, how can California or my particular place contribute to safeguarding global biodiversity? And we do that by having a species protection index and then mapping geopolitically different countries against that index and then allowing countries to see a kind of national report card on how well they're doing to sufficiently protect those areas. And so they understand, you know, what's the delta? What's the gap that I need to fill? What can I do more of? And naturally, different countries have, are at different levels of, of success. And that could be economic, it could be cultural, it could be, you know, all a number of different factors why. Um, but it's really important to figure out what is the specific land and how much can we contribute so that you also can sort of step beyond your geopolitical boundary and say, actually, if we're doing really well, what else could we do for others, you know, other countries in our sphere, other places, other locales? How can we share and spread our resources to help other communities support biodiversity? So it's important to visualize it. And that's what the Half Birth Project map does. It invites people in. It's an open platform. It's free to use. Um, and uh, it complements the wide variety of really good mapping technologies that are out there. Um, other successful maps that are being developed by other conservation organizations so that they can be used in concert to identify those priority areas that need protection. I think it's really exciting. It's, it, it, this, there's never been a more exciting and a more urgent moment for mm -hmm. all of these tools. You know, we, we hang at this moment generationally in this fascinating moment uh, between problems that are sort of bigger than our cognition, that are hard to imagine at scale, and tools that have never been more powerful. And aligning those two is, mm -hmm. you know, is the sort of the, 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 the moral test of our age. I also think the other thing that's, that's interesting is what's coming is not just a, a film strip of doom. Here's what's at risk and here's what's been lost. Mm -hmm. but, but rather with the tools of artificial intelligence and remote sensing and data and all of these, all of these things, when they work together, they tell us about what's likely to occur. You know, we, we um, uh, just as an example, we're continuously monitoring. We take all of our data uh, around the tropical belt from about 30 degrees north to 30 degrees south. All of the 64 tropical countries, we make all of the forest observation data that, that we uh, collect available through the UN to member states for monitoring deforestation. And what we see when we look at deforestation is not just the signs of loss. Uh, we don't just see the field, the forest being turned into fields, but we also see the pre-indicators of the next round of biodiversity. We see the illegal roads going in before the trees are felled. And that's a moment when you can act right at the moment of greatest risk to actually stop the thing from occurring rather than just simply measuring it after it's occurred. Mm -hmm. So these efforts, they, they bring us up to the starting point when we can begin a different kind of dialogue with the planet, a different kind of way of relating. I, I think of these tools as a kind of moral mirror that shows humanity in context that's what the maps that, that Joel's describing do. They help us understand how we relate in a different way to the earth. And, and the thing that's critical about that is that the ultimate change that we need to, to drive is not just behavioral, but it's psychic, it's mental, it's cultural, and it's, it's a moral. level of our values. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, Joel, you're exactly right. It's a moral shift. Mm -hmm. And you can only do that when you see yourself in a new way. Mm -hmm. I think um, every tool of scientific discovery eventually becomes a tool of moral discovery. And that's what's going on here. Mm -hmm. I think that's great. I mean, I, I certainly could talk about this all day. Um, I'm a space nerd and NASA and satellites are super exciting. Um, and I'm also, you know, again, I've being in the sustainability industry for so long, I, I understand the science and the passion behind conservation and the need and importance to do it. So again, just being able to connect those two and that's, that's why we're going to be successful. At least I hope, 
um, because we can bring the two together. Um, we have to work together. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you so much, Andrew and Joel, for having the, taking the time. Um, we will follow up with a live Q&A, so I hope everyone joins us for that as well. Hear your questions and get your insight. Um, thank you again both so much. We really appreciate it, and we will see you soon.